Around the world, the trend towards a cashless society is accelerating. But what will that digital future look like, and how will it vary across the globe? The Economist's correspondents share their insights on the major digital payment systems in three key markets. There have been sort of a few winners from this trend, um, which sort of really accelerated uh, during COVID-19, uh, during the pandemic, when people were sort of having to shop for everything from home. So in particular, in places like the US, people have been using those cards more and more as payments have shifted more digitally. The reason that network is so um, sort of entrenched and so resilient is because it has an extremely sort of clever underlying model, which is that the card issuers, Visa and MasterCard, charge enormous fees to the merchants. Uh, the sort of shoppers, so you know your your coffee shop or or even sort of Amazon and, and Walmart, and those merchants feel like they sort of have to pay those fees. They have to accept these cards because they are so ubiquitous. Uh, most of that fee is sort of routed uh, to the the issuing bank, so J.P. Morgan Chase or Citibank uh, or whoever sort of issued the credit card that you're using, uh, but they use that fee to then pay the consumers who use those cards sort of really enormous rewards. So this is the sort of air miles or hotel points or cashback that Americans have become sort of so accustomed to receiving. Uh, the cards also come with sort of huge amounts of sort of consumer protection. Uh, so, you know, if something isn't delivered as uh, described or sort of an airline cancels your ticket, you have recourse through these credit card companies um, and they can afford sort of all of those luxuries because the fees are so high. And so it is very difficult to see sort of what could um, could disrupt that model because consumers love to use these cards and, uh, and merchants feel like they have to accept them. What India is doing is really a fundamentally different model than, you know, what we have in the West or really even what, uh, you know, China has with digital payments. Um, so it's called uh, Unified Payment Interface or UPI. Uh, it's now the largest digital payment network in the country, a process a trillion dollars in transactions last year, that's about a third of India's GDP. Uh, and the way it works, the government has set up, uh, you know, a nonprofit that's partially owned by the central bank. And it basically sits in the middle of every uh, mobile transaction in the country. Um, so there are a lot of banks, a lot of fintech wallets in India, just like other countries. But what they've done is they made them all uh, talk to each other. Uh, it's called interoperability. Uh, where the UPI system sits in the middle of each one, and they have a common set of standards and APIs that allow, allows for payments between uh, my bank account and your bank account directly, facilitated by a fintech app and the UPI system. Uh, and so it's different than uh, you know the West because uh, there's no need for a credit card network, uh, and so you know people who only have a mobile phone and may not have a credit history. Uh, and might not be able to get into the financial system otherwise are now able to do digital payments. Um, I think that's like a pretty big change for a country that was previously mostly uh, using cash. One of the things that's so fascinating is how a shift towards these type of payments can unlock a whole range of other changes within the financial system as people have uh, more data generated about their transactions. So it changes their credit worthiness, which in turn might change their ability to get insurance or loans. How is that playing out in India? Loan provision has basically taken off, uh, you know, as a result of uh, the data produced by UPI. They have a system where you can basically export your data. Uh, let's say you're using one payment app or one bank, you can export your data, it's called the account aggregator system, and then you can import it into another, uh, you know, uh, financial services environment. So basically allows you to kind of uh, own your own data and, and then get you know financial services from anyone um, and i think that that like kind of linkage between payments and other financial services is what's really taking off around the world okay so we have the newest model i think it's fair to say or one of the newest models in india you have this 60 year old model in america and europe with the the bank card system and then in china you have something different right which is it which is neither uh, you have a statistic in your report, Arjun, about how Alipay and WeChat control about 90% of digital payments in China. And I remember the last time I was in China, this is pre-pandemic, but trying to pay for something with my credit card. And it was even at a Western chain. I think it was a Starbucks. And they had to go to the back and get out a credit card machine and plug it in because everyone else was paying with their phones. And so tell us, for people who might not be familiar, what that payment system looks like and what its longevity is, you think, in China or how it might be used elsewhere? So it's not it's not an open system uh, like UPI is, but it's also not 
like a card network, uh, uh, how the US works. Rather, it's you know a fintech app um, uh, or two, as you mentioned, Alipay and WeChat Pay, and they're closed networks. That means uh, you know you can typically only pay from one Alipay account to another Alipay account, or from one WeChat Pay account to another WeChat Pay account. And the reason why the the, the system kind of took off the way it did is because. In 2011, um, you know, Alipay and Financial, they basically, uh, you know, at the time it was Alibaba, they basically launched uh, a, a QR code system where you could basically scan a QR code at a merchant shop and then you could pay directly. And that was really groundbreaking because previously you needed expensive card readers, as you mentioned, uh, which, you know, a lot of businesses in an emerging market, you know, don't really want to spend money on, which is why they would prefer cash. But QR codes are super cheap. You just need to, you know, slap a sticker on your storefront and then you can start accepting digital payments. And by then smartphones were getting, you know, becoming more ubiqu ubiquitous. So that's kind of what allowed Alipay to really take off. And then WeChat Pay was able to basically copy it and grow because, you know, WeChat was used for messaging, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, as ubiquitous as like a Facebook at, is in the West. Uh, and so, you know, everyone was already onboarded on their platform. So it was very easy for them to kind of already have the network effects built in uh, and then simply add the, the payment business on top of that. And so just to give you context, some context on the numbers here, you mentioned the 90% of uh, statistics, right? 90% of digital payments were happening on these two platforms. It's also a hugely valuable business because of the other services they put around uh, the payments. So, you know, Alipay got, uh, Financial got really into lending, right? Um, you know, right before uh, COVID, uh, you know, something around 20% of all short-term consumer credit was originated by Ant Financial, which is, you know, insane when you think about, uh, you know, how much money is going uh, into lending in these countries. It was supposed to IPO for, you know, $300 billion, but of course that was blocked by the government. Um, and in fact, you know, the, the kind of presence of this type of dominant uh, payment provider that controls so much of the financial system was a bit scary to the to the Chinese government, which is why they ended up doing what they did. And that was actually, you know, uh, 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 one of the motivations for why UPI was designed the way it was, um, is so the system didn't create such huge uh, individual player that cr controlled so much of finance. This video is part of a longer discussion between The Economist journalists. If you're a subscriber, you can watch the whole thing. Please click this link. See you next time. Thank you.